Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. It really is. Um, I have no idea what God has in store for you today. Uh, what has already been said through prayer uh, before we started, uh, what we sang this morning, and the psalm that Jake read, and the prayer that Jake had up here, pretty much says it already. My only goal this morning is to simply glorify God, is for us to simply see who He is so that He is glorified in what He does. And as most of you know, I am going through the book of Mark, and I find sometimes that it's, it seems to be very basic, and even common knowledge to the point that we become bored with uh, the contents of just simply reading the events of Jesus. Like, this is who he was and what he went through, right? And so, you know, comparing that to the writings of Paul, where Paul's letters are designed to teach us to, uh, to stretch our thinking, and his, his letters are so deep, and oftentimes I find that they go over our heads and we miss so much of what he's talking about because they're, they're so profound and so deep. And I do realize that observing Jesus in the Gospels is Old Covenant. These Gospels, they are, they are historical documents. They're not just storybooks and fairy tales. They are literally historical documents that have been found and compiled for us to read. And so much of what's in here is actually history. And I, and I think it's very important for us to understand and believe that that is the case, that this is a history book. And they, they just follow the events of Christ's ministry and the events leading up to the cross where the course of human history has changed forever. But observing Christ as we see written reveals so much more than him as Messiah. And him as Messiah is the ultimate revelation because he is God in the flesh come to redeem man. But we see so many more details, the smaller details that bring to light more and more who he is. The way that he is with the people, reveals to us the love of God in physical form. The way that he handles sin reveals to us the severity of God's, great, or as God's wrath while displaying compassion for the sinner. By observing Jesus in the light of his majesty, and that word's been used a lot this morning already, by observing Jesus in the light of his majesty, we have a better understanding of the darkness that grips our hearts and destroys our world. By the authority of his spoken word, Jesus exposes the devil and his angels for who they really are, bringing their schemes to light. And by the light of Christ, all that is hidden is brought out into the open. In the letters that follow the Gospels, we see the establishment of Christ living in and through us. And these letters, they're very, very deep. And they're designed to teach us Paul really hammers us with new covenant living, and he really brings to light what the Christian life looks like when empowered by the Holy Spirit. And even though most of the New Te Testament is focused on new covenant living for the believer and what that looks like, I find that it is a blessing to go through what at times appears to be the simple stories of Christ, to simply watch and observe him just to see how he operates, how he is, and who he is. I find in them a very focused perspective of the person of Jesus without me in the picture. I'm not looking at learning how do I live the Christian life when I read the Gospels. Sometimes I do. But when I focus in on the person of Christ, it's like I remove myself from the picture and I just simply observe Christ without me even being in existence. And that's objective. I love that. The spotlight is on him as he walks, as he talks, as he exposes so much of his surroundings that only further highlight who he is. It's truly wonderful. So I find that today's text may be surprising because I believe our culture has conditioned our minds to pay attention to controversial or fearful events, while ignoring simple details that fill out the rest of the story. If you watch the news, you know what I mean. In our media age, the headlines have to be catchy. The headlines have to grab your attention. And they don't make the front page if they don't. All the boring stuff gets left for pages three, four, and, and further back. 
because they don't sell. That's not the stuff that makes you want to pick up that newspaper and buy it or go to the article on the website and read it. My hope is that we never see Jesus as page four material. That he is always the highlight on the front page. That Jesus was never defined by his environment or the circumstances that he found himself in. Rather, his surroundings only further exposed him as God in the flesh, as fully God, as fully man, with complete authority over all things physical and spiritual. So before we dive into today's, today's text, uh, let's just start with a quick word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for this um, beautiful day. And uh, even with the sound of the crickets in here, it sounds like we're outside, and it's kind of, kind of neat. Uh, we just thank you for the small little things, and I pray that you would still us so that we don't miss out on the small little details of life. Because I believe that you are hard at work in the small little details of life. That's where you work in, the, in our innermost thoughts, in, in the very darkest places of our heart where you are drawing us day by day, moment by moment to yourself to see more of who you are. So I pray that today we leave our expectations at the door, so to speak, that we leave our preconceived notions of who you are at the door and just come to you as if we don't exist to simply just see who you are, to behold your glory, and to just come to know who you are for who you are. Open up our minds today, Father, to see clearly your majesty, to see clearly your authority and your power. And I pray that it comes and dwells in our hearts that we understand and believe who you are and that you are residing within us. I just thank you for your spirit who interprets, and I thank you for your son who made all of this possible. In his name we pray, amen. So, you take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 5. We'll be going through verses 1 to 20 in Mark chapter 5, 1 through 20. And so they came, and so this is, this is Jesus and his disciples. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. And I'll interject a little piece here from Luke. Luke says that for a long time he had worn no clothes and he had not lived in a house for a long time. And no one can bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles to pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when Jesus, or sorry, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, crying out with a loud voice. He said, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. And then Matthew adds this important little piece here where he says, Have you come to torment us before the time? For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and, and they begged Jesus, saying, send us to the pigs and let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits, they came out and they entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and they drowned in the sea. And the herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. In other words, they were terrified. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had, the possessed, or who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. 
But Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim to the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. So I have to wonder in reading that story, what stood out to you the most? Was it the naked guy wandering around screaming and cutting himself with stones? That's a pretty controversial subject. Kind of interesting. Was it the conversation that Jesus has with a legion of demons? That could also make the headlines. What about the pigs rushing off the edge of a cliff as soon as the demons enter the pigs? So about 2,000 pigs gone like that, drowned in the sea. We want to know more, more about that. These are all important parts of the story. And we'll spend a little bit of time looking at each part of that. But they're not the headlines. They're not the focus. This story is not about the madman. And that's what I'll call the demon-possessed guy, the madman. It's not about the demons, nor is it about the pigs who ran off the cliff. This story is about Jesus and how all the other parts of the story only reveal more about who he is. So, let's take a brief look at this madman. At the end of the story, Jesus tells the man to go home to his friends. This man had what you would call a normal life like everybody else. He had a place to call home, a house to live in, but when Jesus found him, he was living among the tombs. He was living among the dead in a graveyard. That's where he was living. Jesus found this man without his home, without his friends, without clothes. He basically lost everything. Mark also writes that after encountering Jesus, this man is found sitting. He is clothed and in his right mind. But when he first saw Jesus, he ran towards him in his naked state, clearly not in his right mind. What was normal was gone, and those who would have heard him screaming day and night tried to bind him with chains and attempt to control him. It was a very strange situation. I don't know what you would think if you saw someone like this. How would you respond to that? To be honest, there's been a couple of times where I've encountered a homeless person on the side of the street begging for money. And my first thought is stereotypical. What is he going to use the change for that I give him, if I give him any? Right away, I have a reservation. Because I label this man as someone who's probably going to abuse what I give him for his own, for his own sake. But I don't know that. But Looking at this man, how would we respond to a situation like this? How would we label him? Would we simply chalk up this behavior as a mental illness issue? Or would we think that there's much more to it than that? At what point can we know whether something is mental illness or if it's demon possession? I think sometimes we're too quick to jump to one conclusion or the other. In this story, because we had the details, it's obvious because Jesus commands a spirit to come out of this man that he was demon-possessed. But there are other indicators that he was demon-possessed. One of them is his superhuman strength to break the chains. No one could bind him. And he's breaking these shackles to pieces. Right? So chains are designed to be strong enough to contain a human being. But this guy was ripping them up apart and shattering them to pieces. Right, there's still something very odd going on with this. What's also important to note that uh, this is called the region of the Gerasenes, where this is happening. And this is not Jewish territory. And it's indicated by the large herd of pigs that are being herded. Right? So uh, this is an animal that the Jews don't participate in at all. They don't touch it. It's an unclean thing. Pigs are out of the question. So... It's pretty clear that this is not Jewish territory because of the large herd of pigs. 
The people who lived here were likely, well, they're Gentile, mostly, and they likely had not yet heard of Jesus, or at least the miraculous Jesus that has been going around on the other side of the sea. So here's the tell. This madman, when he sees Jesus, he comes running at Jesus and falls down before him, and he calls Jesus out to be who he actually is. This is strange. It really is. This madman should not have known who Jesus truly was, the Son of the Most High God. How could he have known this? One of the telltale signs of demon possession is having knowledge of things one could never know. And this guy had information and knowledge of things that he could not have known. He knew somehow that Jesus was the Son of the Most High God. In Acts chapter 16, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is followed around by a slave girl who, by a spirit of divination, made her owners a lot of money by fortune-telling. She had the ability to tell people things that she could have never known. And people were going to her, asking her kinds of questions because they wanted certain answers, and she was making her owners a lot of money. And she followed Paul around crying out, that him and his men were servants of, again, here's that term, Most High God, who proclaimed the way of salvation. Now, that's a true statement. Paul and his men were servants of the Most High God, proclaiming the way of salvation. But how could she have known that unless another spiritual being would have told her that? Maybe she's prophesying according to the Word of God. But her persistence reveals that this truth was not for the purpose of glorifying God, but rather to be a disturbance as Paul and his men were on their way to pray. So the madman in today's text could not have known Jesus was the Son of the Most High God because of his nationality, where he lived, because he had spent the last span of time possessed by a demon that caused him to scream day and night. How did he know? unless another another spiritual being would have told him. And at this stage in Jesus' ministry, not even Peter had made that proclamation that Jesus is the Messiah. That came later. And Peter had been with Jesus for a time already. Peter had already seen the healings of Jesus. He had already heard the teachings of Jesus. And not even he had yet proclaimed Jesus as the Son of God. And here is this demon-possessed man already professing Jesus, the Most High God. What have you to do with me, right? And then there's the obvious tell, which is plain in the text, is that this man isn't speaking. That it's actually the demon within him that is speaking. And listen to what he says. The demon says, My, singular, my name is Legion. For we, then he goes plural, we are many. So that's kind of fishy, if you ask me. My singular name is Legion, for we are many. Now, Legion, this is what he calls himself, but it's also a term used to describe a division of a Roman army of about 6,000 men. Now, we can't be sure that there's actually 6,000 demons in this man. Maybe there was 2,000 demons enough to fill a herd of 2,000 pigs to send them over the edge. But we can know that there was likely thousands of demons in this man. And regardless of how many there were, this sounds pretty frightening if you ask me. So there's no telling how Legion came to possess this man, but Legion is the cause of this man's ruin. He is the cause of this man losing his home, his friends, his clothes, his sanity, everything. And he's left screaming day and night, cutting himself. So this, this madman, the state of the, of the madman reveals the evil nature of the demons and their bloodlust for mankind's destruction. This madman was created in the image of God. And these demons have reduced him to nothing but a screaming fool. 
They had taken over his mind, leaving him to disregard the health and well-being of his own body. They have wrecked this man. In Mark 9, chapter 9, Jesus is asked to heal a demon-possessed boy who was robbed of speech and was often thrown into fire or water in an attempt to kill him. When Jesus appears, the demon throws the boy to the ground and throws him into a convulsion where he's foaming at the mouth. And when Jesus commands the spirit to leave, the spirit comes out with a shriek, but not before convulsing the boy again violently in in one more attempt to take his life. So we see the nature of the demonic. Their only drive is to see God's beautiful creation destroyed. In spite of him, because they hate God. This reality can be very depressing and fearful if this is all we know about demons. So today's text reveals a great comfort that we can have in knowing that Satan and his angels, they are no match for Jesus. And that's what's revealed in today's text. So in verse 7 of today's text, the demon's crying out with a loud voice, and he says to Jesus, What have you to do with me, son, or Jesus, son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. And as Matthew put, plugs in there, he says, Have you come to torment us before the time? And then he begged earnestly not to be sent out of the country. So this is the demon talking. Do you see how terrified this great number of demons are of Jesus? They are terrified of him. Jesus appears to be but one man against possibly thousands of demons. And they're the ones that come running at Jesus and they fall at his feet. And they are begging for mercy. That's interesting. That's comforting. Now, we could focus on the demons in this passage or the state of the madman, but who is Jesus? That's the question. Who is Jesus that this legion of demons are on the ground begging for mercy? There's the focus. Who is Jesus that a legion of demons are begging for mercy? It's the exact same question that we heard in the previous story when they crossed the sea to get here. The disciples asked, Who is Jesus that the wind and the sea obey him? Who is Jesus? If you confess Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, Think about what he has done for you in regards to your salvation. Think about that. Think about how he has changed you, how he has transformed you, how he is transforming you. Think about how he has saved you personally. And hold that close to your heart. Now ask yourself this question. Who is my Jesus? My loving, gracious Jesus. Who appears to be so kind and so gentle, so forgiving, so gracious, that a legion of demons would cower before him, trembling in fear. Do you know this Jesus? What are the demons afraid of? They are terrified of Christ's authority because they know something this madman could never have known. Listen to this question that they ask, according to Matthew. Have you come to torment us before the time? They know that hell awaits them. And they know that Jesus is the one who's going to send them there. Jesus is the one who will sentence them. And they are afraid that Jesus has shown up to do that. It's now now time already? 
They are terrified. They're not ready to go. Have you come to torment us before the time? They are terrified. Because they know there's nothing they can do about it. That is their doom. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says that all authority on heaven and earth is given to him. And we've heard that before. And we may think that's great. But do we grasp the reality of that? These demons do. And they are at their wit's end with that knowledge. And they don't know what to do with themselves when they see Jesus, but fall at his feet. That is the only option. Beg for mercy. So we'll look at the pigs just briefly here. And so the demons, they, they beg to be sent into the pigs. There's more to be said about the pigs than we have time for today, but let's maintain our focus on the authority of Christ. So this request for permission reveals a couple of things. It reveals who is really in control of the spiritual realm. In the same way that God puts limitations on what Satan is allowed to do to Job, we can clearly see that these demons are not moving beyond the bounds set before them. That they are restricted. And number two, demons have an insatiable desire for chaos and destruction. It's like that can't be quenched. Because as soon as they are sent into the pigs, the demons drive the whole herd off the edge and drown the pigs in the sea. They seek destruction to its final end. And these two points, again, are not the point, but these two points, they highlight the loving character of God towards those who he has made in his image, while at the same time displaying his power and authority in restraining free reign of the forces of darkness. All of the forces of darkness, they don't go unnoticed by God. God sees it all. The madman in this text had been possessed for a long time. And the worst thing that the legion did was to occupy his mind and harm his flesh. And in the process, take his whole life from him. But the moment that legion entered the pigs, they were drove to their death. Right? So why wasn't the man driven to death immediately? There has to have been some kind of restraint. So, the general overview. You may think that a life may not be worth living with a demon occupying your mind, causing you to lose your home, friends, and sanity. But we can clearly see that to God, every possible moment where Jesus can come in and redeem the situation is precious. Every moment is precious. Had Legion succeeded in killing the madman, Jesus would not have saved him and restored him. And if we look at the story as a whole, and just do a quick overview from beginning to end, we see this man had a relationship. And he was then separated from that relationship. And he was then held captive by the forces of darkness. And then a savior comes from across the waters through a dangerous storm to confront and remove that darkness, leaving that man restored and in a better place than where he was before. Furthermore, this savior heads back across the waters and tells the man to stay and share the news of what has happened to him. This is the story of the Bible, wrapped up in this short little story. This story captures glimpses of the Garden of Eden, the fall of man, the treacherous journey of God appearing to us in the flesh to defeat the devil and the restoration of his creation, and the great commission to tell the world of what he has done. That's it in a nutshell. That's the headline. God is the headline. Everything in this story speaks of Jesus and gives God all the glory. The madman revealed the compassion of Christ. The legion's fear revealed the ultimate authority of Christ. 
and the pigs reveal the sovereignty of God. We, not, we may not be able to relate to the events of today's text. I have never seen a demon-possessed man or a man screaming around, running around naked for that matter either. I've never even seen a herd of pigs. I've seen a couple here and there. We may not be able to relate to today's text. But we can get to know more about Jesus for who he actually is. We may never be faced with demon possession. But it does not mean that our Jesus isn't equipped to handle whatever comes our way. Jesus is more than we will ever need. He is mighty and to be held in awe of simply who he is apart from us. He is not ashamed of the naked. He is not uncomfortable with the insane. He is unfazed by darkness and not moved by fear. Fear is afraid of him. The devil has convinced the world that the devil doesn't exist. And the world has painted the devil as someone to be afraid of. Neither is true. Satan and his angels are very real. But we have no need to fear them. Because they are absolutely terrified of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They don't stand a chance. Like a boy who brags about how much stronger his dad is than everyone else's dad. That boy identifies with his dad because he is his dad and that's it. The boy has nothing to brag about of himself except that he is his father's son. As Christians, we must identify with Christ in the same way. Regardless of what we have done, of who we think we are, where we have come from, what we're capable of, what we look like. Just remove me from the picture. Remove yourself from the picture. Like a child, we simply boast in the Lord Jesus because we are identified with a Savior who can do exceedingly more than we can possibly imagine. That's our Savior. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Creator of this world, righteous judge, the exerciser of demons, the one who has all authority to do whatever pleases him, and it pleases him to save us. That is our Jesus. My hope is that we get to see the full scope of who God is. We want that tender, loving, compassionate Jesus. Because we know our shortcomings and our sin. We know our darkness and we need his forgiveness and mercy. And when our world is turning upside down, we want his peace. We want understanding when we don't know what to do. And so it's easy for us to paint Jesus as just this one type of character. But may we never forget that he is fully that, but he is also fully God with all authority to completely and fully judge as righteous as he is. And that is the fullness of our God who has chosen to save us, who has chosen to be compassionate towards us, who has chosen to call us his own and prepare a place for us that we can live forever. I pray we come to know the fullness of who God is and not just the parts that we like about him. Yes, he is terrifying. He is the most terrifying person, the most terrifying being. But because we are in his graces, we don't need to be afraid of him. Mike, Pastor Mike, shared a prayer at our meeting on Thursday. And it's very, very simple and profound. May we understand or come to know the severity of what God did so that we can come to him and sit in his lap. To know the power of God and how terrifying it is, but to be comfortable enough to know we can run to him, sit in his lap.
That is who our God is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the big headlines in your word. And we thank you for the small little details that your followers have so carefully written down. And all these little highlights make you pop, make you stand out in the picture. They make you real. May we come to see the fullness of who you are. And even if it takes a lifetime, that we tremble before you because you love us so much, but also because of how, how amazingly powerful you are. And again, that severity of what you have done to bring us to this place so that we can come to you. Your throne is where you sit. Your throne room is where you are glorified. And where you are is the most holy, most righteous place in existence. And you have called us to come before your throne. May you fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can understand how bold we can be because you've given us a spirit of boldness. Father, I pray for every individual in this room, for anyone who's watching, that whatever we are facing, that you always call us to come to you with whatever we are carrying, to lay it at your feet, so that we can rest in you, trusting that you can completely and fully take care of us right to the end. You have what it takes. You have more than enough for us. We thank you so much for your grace. We thank you so much for your loving kindness, for your mercy upon us. And Father, we thank you so much for your strength and your power and authority that you have overcome death, that death no longer has any dominion over you and over those who believe in you. We thank you that you are unstoppable. We thank you that you are sovereign, that you are fully and totally complete, self-sustaining, and the fact that you don't even need us, and yet you call our names. I pray that this becomes a reality in our hearts and that we can begin to live from that belief and fully beginning to understand who you truly are. We thank you for being so amazing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'll leave you with this benediction and then the worship team will come up and lead us in a few songs. Ephesians 3, 20-21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. And may the peace of God rest on you all time.